Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yosef Sered. I'm an associate professor of religion and African American African diaspora studies here at Columbia University. And it is my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel um, entitled The Theoretical Turn. If you are perhaps asking what this theoretical turn is, then you are in the right place. Um, I want to begin, first of all, if you are looking uh, for Sadia Hartman, who is on the program, you are still in the right place, but she will be uh, not participating in this panel, but will be introducing uh, the conversation later this evening with Tina Kampf and Arthur Jaffa. Um, I do want to thank, however, both Sadia and Farah for helping to imagine this panel uh, through a series of emails and exchange that led to this amazing group of scholars who are before us. Uh, yes, let's welcome them. And so what I would like to do first, uh, as our call and their call, their invitation to conversation, uh, what you have before you in the program, the significance of theory has long been a question for scholars who locate themselves in relationship to the interdisciplinary field of African American and African diaspora studies. At the same time, one could argue that black studies itself constitutes a theory of the modern world and of how to produce knowledge in the wake of modernity's central contradictions such as slavery and freedom. That said, in recent years, black studies has been enlivened by engagements with a variety of theoretical resources uh, that have yielded multiple trajectories, thinking of Afrofuturism, Afro-pessimism, Af black performance studies, black queer studies, to name just a few. This is what I was told in passing several years ago now is often referred to under the rubrics of a theore the theoretical turn in black studies. Our panelists today are charged with assessing the resources and weighing the prospects for future work within what some have referred to no as this now novel theoretical turn. The panelists will present uh, in the order in which they appear on the program and I will introduce them uh, one at a time. First, we will hear from uh, Professor Rizvana Bradley. Uh, Professor Bradley is an assistant professor of the history of art in African American studies at Yale University. She, she received her PhD from Duke, BA from Williams, and participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program. Professor Bradley's research intersects with anti-colonial politics, feminist and gender studies, continental philosophy, post-colonial theory, and aesthetic theory. Her first forthcoming book manus manuscript was awarded a Creative Capital's Art Writers Grant, and other writing appears in Film Quarterly, Black Camera, TDR, The Drama Review, Women in Performance, Parkett, and Art and... America. She's contributed to such catalogs for the New Museum, House de Cultural Den Velt, ICA Philadelphia, Art Basel, the Berlin Biennial, White Chapel Gallery in London. Let's welcome Professor Bradley. Thank you so much for that um, introduction and thank you to the organizers. Um, I really appreciate being here and being able to think with this phenomenal group of, of scholars and thinkers. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'll just begin. This paper formulates a key problematic for thinking about the ongoing production and generativity of black aesthetics in relation to contemporary theoretical discourses that grapple with the primacy of affect. I shift theoretical emphasis away from a discussion of the structuration of affective attachments, as well as the corresponding expressions of belonging or unbelonging they do or do not make possible within the protracted lifespan of democratic life. Instead, I trace the entanglement of black life and artistry with the violent politicality of the everyday. Briefly, I examine the work of the mixed media artist and painter, Howardina Pindell, who develops an aesthetic repertoire that considers, that reconsiders the ontoepistemological stakes of art making. That is, in Pindell's work, we confront the way a distinctly black feminist anti-racist performance intervenes into the given knowledge of the world, providing an analytical lens that labors as a corrective to humanism's violent engendering of feeling. Zakia Jackson prefers that, quote, man's culture-specific mode of identity and self-referentiality lead to affective and epistemological closures. The ineluctable deadpan that drives Howardina Pindell's enactment of performative counter cells in her 1980 work, Free, White, and 21, punctures the affective economy of the racist social orders imposed limits on feeling, sense, and consciousness. 
So staying at critical distance from the circulating terms within affect theory discourse, I theorize what I call the performed detachments, the disagreeable, difficult, and distorting grammars of subjectification and desubjectification, de definitive of raced and gendered performances that dispute the normative political genres of American life. Before commencing with my discussion of Howardina Pindell, it is worth noting that my understanding of affective detachment moves by way of and diverges from the changing valences of attachment and detachment as terms that emerge within affect theory. Lauren Berlant argues that modes of detachment, quote, are really not detached at all, but constitute ongoing relations of sociality, end quote. Berlant allows us to think about the cruel optimism of the American good life, its dashed promises of security, sanctuary, hope, and beauty. Berlant thinks profoundly and oftentimes inconveniently about the difficulty of detaching from life-building modalities that, as she puts it, can no longer be said to be doing their work. Berlant writes of, quote, the affective attachment to what we call the good life, which is for so many a bad life that wears out the subjects who nonetheless, and at the same time, find their conditions of possibility within it. My assumption is that the conditions of ordinary life in the contemporary world, even of relative wealth, as in the United States, are conditions of the attrition of, or the wearing out of the subject, and that the irony that the labor of reproducing life in the contemporary world is also the activity of being worn out by it, has specific implications for thinking about the ordinariness of suffering, end quote. I am interested in the way black performance alerts us to a dehiscence, a rupturing or splitting open of the political, in that it reveals what Frank Wilderson describes as the irreconcilability of anti-blackness with what Berlant terms the ordinariness of suffering, that for her defines the labor of reproducing life in the contemporary world. It is necessary to unburden black emotional life and experience from what Wilderson calls the ruse of analogy. For it is not simply that the good life is and never has been an option. In the present iteration of the heteropatriarchal order, it increasingly appears that public, public consensus in American political life necessitates on the one hand the violent expropriation and commodification of black culture, and on the other, the exclusion of blackness and black social life practices from the assumption of a functioning demos. Black artic artistic praxis remains attuned to these contradictory variations of American political life, generating performances of detachment that break the loop or circuit of the cruelly optimistic relation to the political and the therapeutic ideals of democracy. Howardina Pindell's video work, Free White and 21, which thematizes black affective life as under assault in the charged moment of the American culture wars, paradoxically repositions black female artistry as central to the arc of post-war avant-garde performance by modeling political dissent through performative distortions of racialized and gendered subjectivity. This paper begins to think about the way Pindell structures the relationship between black performance and political discontent by way of a pointed interrogation of white femininity. It argues that structured into the performative unconscious of Pindell's particular performance is an understanding of how the geopolitical agendas of the nation cannot be disentangled from the sexuality of white femininity. 1980, Free White and 21 was produced a year after Howardina Pindell exited MoMA, Dissatisfied with the politics of representation established by a status quo art world, its exclusions and emissions, the video was completed one year after Artist Space exhibited the, the work of a white artist, Donald Newman, called the N-Word Drawings. Pindell, who joined a protest there with the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, participated in town halls and joined artists who penned open letters to Artist Space. She and her peers were confronted with an open letter from prominent curators and scholars who supported the show on the grounds of freedom of expression. As Aruna D'Souza recounts, the counter protesters, including art historians and critics, who would go on to become iconic figures in the art world, Rosalind Krauss, Douglas Crimp, Craig Owens, and many others, deployed the sophisticated postmodern conceptual tools to argue that the N-word had no meaning outside its relationship to this artist's drawings. Since the drawings were abstract, their logic continues, the word was not being used in a racist way. After the incident at Artist Space, Pindell has said that her work turned more political. 
I do not take this to mean that the abstraction of Pindell's earlier work and the critical assertiveness characteristic of her later work signaled in the shift toward autobiographical references to her experiences with racism are opposed. Art historian Kelly Jones's observations about Pindell run counter to prevailing interpretations that have pointed to a clear political trajectory in the artist's work. Jones prefers that, quote, the evolution of Pindell's paintings, the embrace of figures, lush applications of color and text, and indeed the autobiographical turn, began with the video performance work, Free, White, and 21, a peon to art real world racism, end quote. Referring directly to the political climate at the time the work was made, the artist describes, quote, bristling at the women's movement as well as the art world and some of the usual offensive encounters that were heaped on top of the racism of my profession, end quote. The autobiographical turn Jones identifies is important because of the way autobio autobiography in Jones, quote, becomes the act of declaring the existence of a surviving, enduring ethnic self, end quote. This leads us to a different understanding of Pindell's abstract approach because it complicates her relationship to both aesthetics and politics. In the flourish of disagreement and backlash over the artist's show, Pindell and her peers faced at the time, the voice of a white woman was resounding. As Pindell has recounted, quote, there was a friend of the director, a white woman artist, and she said, who do you think you are coming down here and telling us what to do? This is a white neighborhood. The white woman's reproach importantly underscores the entanglement of the political stakes of artistic representation and the lack of racial and gender solidarity within those institutionalized contexts. Central to Pindell's conceptualization of Free White and 21 is the artist's embodied assumption of three performing avatars. Performance studies scholar Yuri McMillan has identified them as firstly a version of Pindell of the white woman she will later embody sans white makeup, the second fully covered in white gauze material that is slowly and dramatically unwrapped as Pindell appears in front of an orange background. The third avatar is white woman. For the final avatar, Pindell places a white stocking over her head and in a high pitched voice exclaims, you ungrateful little, after all we have done for you, you know we don't believe in your symbols. They are not valid unless we validate them. And you must be really paranoid. I have never had experiences like that, but of course, I am free, white, and 21. The term avatar is applied to Pindell to mean the strategic adoption of performative strategies of impersonation. These avatar selves are virtual multiplications of the self that extend and distort the autobiographical dimensions of Pindell's childhood, adolescent, and adult experiences. However, these avatar selves mediate between Pindell's violent encounters of racism within the world and to partially echo Kelly Jones, the experimental drive to survive and endure it. To be more precise, Pindell's partially autobiographical avatar selves provide psychic alternatives to letting the violence of the world consume her unconscious. In the absence of the therapeutic reprieve of a talking cure, Pindell's avatar selves vitiate the demand that the psychic health of the world be sustained at the expense of securing blackness as its psychotic foil. Additionally, Free White and 21 offers an excavation of the enduring and much repeated all-American catchphrase engineered by the Hollywood studio system of the 1930s and 1940s. Pindell lifts the phrase from its Hollywood cinema origins and transposes it to the context of contemporary struggles over political representation in the art world. Her resourcing of the phrase makes it operate on two levels. It becomes the site and source for innovative black autobiographical experimentation, and it performs a critical interrogation of the ways in which racialized gender violence explicitly intersects with aesthetic valuation. But Pindell also exposes the force of the repetition compulsion of the phrase within a cinematic imaginary obsessed with the fantasy of projection and vertiginous reproduction of the violent gendering of racial whiteness. The work indicts cinema as part of America's racist symbolic unconscious, pointing to the cinema's compulsion to repeat precisely that violence. Consider for a moment the 1959 film, The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. 
In it, there is a provocative moment shared between the film's two protagonists, Ralph Burton, a black miner played by Harry Belafonte, and Sarah Crandall, a white woman played by Inger Stevens. Both characters find themselves developing a friendship while simultaneously confronting the grim reality of being condemned to survive the world after a nuclear holocaust has wiped out all but five civilians on the planet. Taking shelter indoors from a rainstorm, the, change between, the exchange between them unfolds as follows. Burton, all the books are getting wet and dry. Crandall, I know and everything is getting rusty, including me. Burton, you have to try to stay busy like I do. Crandall, I'm free white and 21 and I'm going to do what I please. <laughs> Stevens is, I tried to read it in the voice of the, uh, anyway. <laughs> Stevens's, Stevens's glare at Belafonte is returned slowly, resolutely by him, registering a look that can only be described as subversive in its contentiousness. Belafonte's performance signals his character's expected confirmation and sheer disbelief in Sarah Crandall's racist utterance, which claims the aesthetic platform of femininity as a justification for the ontological supremacy of whiteness. In the world, the flesh, and the devil, Sarah Crandall's assertion ought to be regarded as an all-encompassing worldview, as nothing less than a white Weltanschauung. The piercing irony of the scene, of course, lies in the bitter revelation that even when the world falls away, the belief in the racialized value structures of this world remain in place. The words that spill out of this youthful white woman contaminate the flow of their dialogue and presage a world outside the frame. Here, narrative dialogue functions as a means of diegetic and extra-diegetic worlding. As one half of the unrequited love interest, Sarah Crandall's assertion regrounds Burton in the position of the unfree. Her utterance here is filled with the forceful violence of all the cinematic repetitions that preceded it. The declaration, I'm free white and 21, sutures political freedom to the fantasy of youthful white femininity. Cinema's engineering of the nexus of freedom, racial whiteness, and the unbounded autonomy signaled by youth weaponizes white sexuality behind the dissembling mask of aestheticized white femininity in ways that compel us to consider whether American cinema in disseminating ideologies about racialized gendered sovereignty is one of many technologies of social death. 29 years ago, Howardina Pindell offered an artistic response to, political, to a political landscape whose dominant feminist discourse remained unapologetically tethered to a steadfast belief in the fragility of femininity gendered as white. Pindell can be credited with anticipating the extent to which the consensus around white vulnerability, always gendered as feminine, would come to obtain objective value as a prerequisite for democracy. Free White and 21 throws into further relief the social antagonisms engendered by racism as particularly bound up with socioeconomic, institutionalized, and gendered hierarchies of subjectification. It is a work that demonstrates that the project of gendering femininity as white remains central to America's demo de American democracy's political lexicon, its grammars of identification and belonging, of representational valuation and worth. And the enduring myth of white female ascendancy continues to reestablish itself as the underlying logic for reigning fantasies about social individuation and political autonomy. In Free White and 21, Pindell's performative accounting of the racist violence done to her and her mother fully metabolizes the forms of racial sexual coercion that are themselves generated within a broader set of social, political, and economic relations regulated and con controlled by the racial state. Paradoxically, Howardina Pendel's performance in Free White and 21 registers aesthetic expression as divided between a deadpan account of racism that performatively detaches from the prevailing political atmosphere and the intensification of dissonant racialized affects that upset the psychic equilibrium through which gender integrity, to borrow a phrase from Frank Wilderson, is secured. You know she must be paranoid. What would it mean, finally, to think of Howardina Pindell as principal paranoiac? Troping the twinned conditions of paranoia and narcissism, the artist deploys them against any prevailing pathological account. Here, Lacan is useful as he, is as he viewed paranoia as the exemplary form of psychosis. However, for Lacan, all knowledge is imbued with paranoia. All knowledge is paranoiac knowledge. 
This is because, he explains, the process of knowing inevitably confronts the real, namely what is unassimilable, indescribable. In the end, I want to mark a certain tension between the efficacy of an Afro-pessimist critique of the idea of sentient gendered being and the breakdown of that logic in the face of the affective transgressions Pindell performs in Free, White, and 21. These affective transgressions, to borrow from Eve Sedgwick's queer affect theory, perhaps build upon paranoia as a certain hermeneutic of aggravated suspicion and negative affects, but even more so, they revalue the affective field so that the pleasures of black experimentation and black praxis can be located in their proximity to the real. I want to think further about black experimental aesthetics as animated by a kind of paranoid knowledge and registration of the, of the gratuitous violence that bleeds out beyond the symbolic to the real, as Wilderson puts it. In Pindell's work, a distinctly black feminist experimental diagnostic gets performed on the cinematic remains of white femininity in order to, one, reveal white femininity's pathological tendencies in directing the phobic racial anxieties of civil, civic society, civil society, and two, to extend paranoia as an effective gesture beyond the dignities of repair. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bradley. Uh, next, we will hear from Professor Zakia Iman Jackson, who is an assistant professor of English at the University of Southern California, working at the intersection of African diasporic literature and visual culture, philosophical metaphysics, science, and aesthetics. Her research explores historical and emergent linkages between the humanities and the sciences on the question of being. Professor Jackson's book in progress, titled Being and Blackness, Matter and Meaning, after Man is forthcoming with NYU Press. She has public work in feminist studies, gay and lesbian quarterly, qui parle, critical humanities and social sciences, catalyst, feminist theory and technoscience, and South Atlantic quarterly. Let's welcome Professor Jackson. What? Oh, no, this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, Thank you to everyone who helped to organize this conference and thank you for the opportunity to continue to think with um, my co-panelists. Oh, I'm still talking, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is remarkable the way that genealogies of contemporary biopolitics, biocapital, organ markets, and tissue economies a lie to reckoning with histories of African enslavement in general, and the Atlantic slave trade in particular, as the Atlantic trade along with the annexation of the Americas, as Sylvia Winter reminds, are the threshold to the global scale. A threshold that must be ritualistically crossed with each successive redrawing of the world map. For instance, in her introduction to the volume Commodifying Bodies, edited by Louis Quaquant, Nancy Shepard Hughes, in contemplation of the organ trade's contemporary form and character, states the following. Quote, there are, of course, many genealogies and continuities one could explore from the animated cell collection and veneration of medieval relics of the bodies of Catholic saints, to the grave robbings of the 16th and 17th century. Um, so I'm just gonna gloss some of this quote. Um, she mentions barbers and surgeons in search of corpses for dissection, the sale of hair and teeth in, 19th, in the 19th century to the late 20th century markets in kidney, ova, semen, stem cells, genetic material, material and codes. Okay, and returning to the uh, quotation. At one level, then, the commodification of the body is a new discourse linked to the incredible expansion of possibilities through recent advances in biomedicine, transplant surgery, experimental genetic medicine, biotechnology, and the sciences of genomics in tandem with the spread of global capitalism and the consequent speed at which patients, technologies, capital, bodies, and organs can now move across the globe. But on another level, the commodification of bodies is continuous with earlier discourses on the desire, need, and scarcity of human bodies and body parts for religious edification, healing, dissection, recreation, and sports, and for medical experimentation and practice." End quote. 
Later in the volume, Shepard Hughes does make a passing reference to slavery, but it is that of the Greeks. She recalls that when the Hippocratics established the foundations of medical science, they recognized two classes of patients, freemen and slaves. From there, Shepard Hughes draws an analogy, quote, Similarly, commercialized transplant medicine has allowed global society to be divided into decidedly unequal populations, organ givers and organ receivers. The former are an invisible and discredited collection of anonymous suppliers of spare parts. The latter are, chair, are cherished patients, treated as moral subjects and as suffering individuals. Their names and their biographies and medical histories are known and their proprietary rights over their bodies and body parts of the poor, living and dead, are virtually unquestioned, end quote. Yet the political economic conditions of contemporary globalized, globalizing trade are conditioned not by a single linear teleological line from the ancients to the present, but by one marked by racial slavery and colonialism's mutation of scale, both at the register of idea and material practice. This mutation of scale is integral to a hegemonic mutation of ontology, what exists, and space-time, the arrangement of being itself. We have to ask after the conditions that produce universalist humanism and globality as homologous productions rather than presuppose them as givens. If, as Foucault maintains, our current hegemonic universalist conception of man is a mutation of prior metaphysical conceptions of being, then I would qualify this insight by insisting that this mutation was and continues to be an effect of slavery, conquest, and colonialism. The metaphysical question of the human as one of species in particular arose through the organizational logics of racialized sexuation and the secularizing imperatives, largely economic but not exclusively so, of an imperial paradigm that sought dominion over life writ large. At the meeting point of natural philosophy and the so-called age of discovery, natural science instituted its representational logics of somatic difference in ever-increasingly secularized, ontologized terms. The transcultural adoption of our current hegemonic and specifically biocentric conception of the human in its distinction from the animal as defined in the ontotheological terms of natural science articulated black female abjection as a prerequisite of human qualification and the newly conceived global terms that occasion discovery. Biocentrism, as defined by Winter, is the belief that we are biological beings who then create culture. In other words, according to a biocentric logic, human cultural practices are linearly determined by groups' respective bioontological composition. Racism, Sylvia Winter argues, is an effect of the biocentric conception of the human. She contrasts this belief system's reductive investment in DNA as substratum and mechanistic causation with an alternative. Quote, my proposal is that we are bioevolutionarily prepared by means of language to inscript and auto-institute ourselves in this or that modality of the human, always in adaptive response to the ecological as well as to the geopolitical circumstances in which we find ourselves. End quote. The abjection of the African female as commodified object and specimen is an indispensable precept of the global political economic entanglements that scholars such as Shepard Hughes are presently trying to draw our attention to. In other words, if we want to analyze the conjunctive meaning of globality, bioscience, and capitalism, we cannot just take these terms as if axiomatic. We must instead reckon with the historical emergence of these terms and the conditions of their renewal as givens. From such a vantage point, biocapital and its racial hierarchies that are both its cause and effect do not register as new, but rather business as usual for global capital. Earlier, I referenced Shepard Hughes's analysis of the black market that the term black market has been etymologically linked to the market of African slaves in the 18th century resonates with claims made here concerning the determinate role of raciality to capitalism generally and to the trade in Africans in particular for the very idea of the global market. 
Black market is not a term that references unregulated commerce as it is often claimed, but more precisely, as the Shio Mbembe has suggested, commerce regulated by raciality and colonialities enduring hierarchies that largely interpolate African peoples not as workers or trade partners, but as consumers of outmoded technologies and commodities, excess or consumable resources, which brings me to Brown Girl in the Ring. Hopkinson's story, Brown Girl in the Ring, focuses on three generations of black Caribbean Canadian seer women and their struggle for physical and psychic survival and the cordon off economically devastated urban core of near future Toronto known as the Burn. The names of the women, Mommy Grosjean, Daughter Mijan, and Granddaughter Tijan, are an allusion to the Derek Walcott play Tijan and his brothers which explores the epistemological problems wrought by slavery and colonialism, particularly the loss of indigenous knowledge and the gap between colonial knowledge and its applicability in the life world of a colonized person. And in exploration of similar questions, Brown Girl on the Ring uses tropes of African religion, in particular spirit possession and aspects of double consciousness, such as bird and gift and second sight, to explore the modern grammar of representation and its economies of value. In the aftermath of the city's economic collapse and the large-scale riot that emerged in its wake, with the city aflame and in an extreme case of white flight, those who could flee to the urban perimeter did so. They took along with them the city's goods and administrative services. Abandoned by state representatives and economically at the mercy of centrifugal forces, inner city Toronto developed an alternative and formal economy, one that is governed by a ruthless drug lord named Rudy. The premier of Toronto, suffering from heart failure, recently became aware of something the public had not. The sudden emergence of a zoonotic virus made it untenable to continue the porcine organ donor program. No longer under the cover of rights and protection and in an attempt to expropriate what resources remain in the burn, representatives of the ailing premier hire Rudy and his posse to procure a human heart from someone in the burn. Tijan begins an epic quest to defeat Rudy and his posse, but unfortunately she is not able to do so before they murder and claim her grand grandmother's heart for the premiere. In order to confront the tragic mystery surrounding her mother and grandmother, Tijan must open herself to supernatural powers and counterintuitive truths that exceed her sense of self and reality, as well as challenge the coordinates of the given world. Considering the nature of this format, I will limit my analysis to a reading of the author's formal choices regarding narrative setting and its politics of spatiality and identify the significance of interrelations of space and time for the novel's exploration of racialized and gendered thematics of biopolitics and biocapitalism. What Hopkinson does is write the co-formation of racial slavery and racial capitalism back into global capitalism, biopolitics and biocapital, largely through, but not limited to, formal choices, choices regarding narrative setting, namely the depiction of the burn and the suburbs as concentric circles and co-constitutive interrelational bodies. In Fractal Thinking, Denise De Silva argues that urban warfare in the economically dispossessed spaces of Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the US, and Canada, allegorically depicted by the burn in the novel, is integral rather than simply the effect of, or in excess of, the ethical juridical assemblage that facilitates global capital's access to the productive resources, bodies, and lands it needs in order to thrive and reproduce. As with the case of the concentric circles demarcating the burn from the suburbs, borders perform paradoxically. They purport to divide one geopolitical site from the other, while the very performativity of division reveals that they are internal and determinate of one another. De Silva argues that racial slavery and coloniality figure in all shapes of capital, yet in a recapitulation of Marx's foundational displacement of the slave and obfuscation of coloniality, contemporary critics of biocapitalism reduce the integral to a linear temporality or to an accumulative or developmentally separate uh, process. 
De Silva makes a case for a kind of thinking which she terms fractal thinking, that she argues does not sever the links between various incarnations of capital across the fabric of space-time, but rather avows racial slavery and coloniality as determinate and constitutive, such that our global capitalistic present is internal to the plenteous fractal complexity of racial slavery and coloniality. As De Silva puts it, quote, when approaching what happens as a composition, it is possible to attend to its constitutive elements, which may also be part of other compositions, what has happened and has yet to happen, comprising similar elements. Because it attends to four dimensions, depth, width, length, and time, fractal thinking, poethical or compositional thinking, images the global as part of the cosmos, and as such does not see it as constituting the ultimate ontic and ontological horizon for thinking. For since what happens occurs in the plenum, it is both an expression of and expressed by whatever exists under, above, and alongside, what has already passed and what is yet to come, end quote. To put it another way, Colonial expropriation, capitalist exploitation, and raciality, raciality operating in a mode of total violence have already internal to their terms and logic the potential for the organ market, black organ market, tissue economies, and biocapital. Shepard Hughes, Melinda Cooper, Kaushik Sundar Rajan, among others, want to map hier hierarchy principally in spatial terms, global north, global south, without attending to the ways, the way these terms, global north, global south, act as a metaphor for race and the, raci and the way raciality confounds the language of geopolitical spatial polarity and critiques of globalization and post-colonial critique. In Brown Girl, inner city Toronto is depicted as if it were Shepard Hughes's global south, not because it represents the global south as depicted by theorists critical of biocapital bio and globalization, but rather because the Burns spatial carcerality is coextensive and inseparable from the carcerality of the flesh. The concentric spatial arrangement of Toronto proper vis-a-vis -vis the burn reveals their total imprecation and, a and are a vehicle for the narrative's depiction of the interrelationality of state and capital and the flesh of raciality. In De Silva's articulation of fractal thinking, one can hear resonances of Horton Spiller's theses on the a-linearity of slavery, myth, and Mariology are the part-whole relation in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. In that now classic essay, Spiller's articulates a distinction between flesh and body as foundational to respective modes of captive and liberated subject positions. Quote, before the body, there is the flesh, that zero degree of social conceptualization that does not escape concealment under the brush of discourse are the reflexes of iconography. Even though the European hegemony stole bodies, some of them female, out of the West African communities in concert with African middlemen, we regard this human and social irreparability as high crimes against the flesh, as the person of African females and males registered the wounding. If we think of the flesh as primary narrative, then we mean it's seared, divided, ripped apartness, riveted to the ship's hole, fallen or escaped overboard, end quote. Before the body, there is the flesh, Spillers writes. Here, the before has spatial as well as temporal significance, as before recalls that the master class gains a sense of proprietary embodiment and sovereign eye retroactively, whereby the ekphrastic scenes of enfleshment she describes act as a mirror stage, such that the other is spatially before the lash, and her ensuing corporeal fragmentation hypostasizes, i.e. converges literal and figurative meaning in the abstractions made of her flesh. Regarding the scavenging sale and atomization of disease and disabled black flesh, she suggests, quote, this profitable atomizing of the captive body provides another angle on the divided on the divided flesh. We lose any hint or suggestion of a dimension of ethics, of relatedness between human personality and its anatomical features, between human personality and cultural institutions. To that extent, the procedures adopted for the captive flesh demarcate a total objectification as the entire captive community becomes a living laboratory, end quote. 
and life support, biocapital, and the new history of outsourced labor, Kalindi Vora writes, quote, it remains difficult to calculate the value of an organ for, trans for transplant, though they are traded and therefore have a price because it is so closely tied to the social and economic value of a person as a worker. If you can't find work, you sell something else. The going price for an organ or for gestation by a surrogate is thus partially determined by the seller's own value in the marketplace, end quote. Yet part of what draws the expropriation of Mami Grosjean's heart close to the enslavement Spiller theorizes is that the means of procurement in the novel bypass both the question of labor's recognition and the terms of exchange altogether. Mami Grosjean's position at and as the zero degree of the social is determinant of the terms and logic of exchange and the setting of market values for the worker. Moreover, Vore continues, quote, labor like human vital organs can be understood as a specific portion of a person's body and life that can be made free to travel by being constructed as extra or not needed where it is currently located. Before a human kidney or a given task or type of labor can become seemingly unnecessary in its immediate context and therefore available for outsourcing, it must be the object of, spec of specific cultural and material practices that establish it as unnecessary. For example, the construction of the second kidney in the human body as surplus illustrates the way medical technology, in this case surgical technique and immune suppressing pharmaceuticals, intersects with technologies of mobility and the medical definition of utility of kidneys as reduplicative in the body thus surrendering its surplus in the context of the global demand for transplant organs. As the construction of a specific idea of surplus, the kidney is freed to have an existence separate from the body that produced it. However, tracing the flows of capital that allowed for the mobility of the kidney also reveals concomitant limits of the mobility of whole bodies that lead people to need to sell an organ, limits that are created by the same process that free the kidney in the first place, end quote. But what happens when recognition of a whole body a self-possessed body does not take hold and the flesh as dispossession is a sin qua non of existence. Or to put it more pointedly, what if the very notion of a sovereign integral self-possessed body is intrinsic to the production of the slave's existence as its privileged obverse? In the case of Mami Grosjean, there is no need to create elaborate networks, medical, capital, and state that exploit and capitalize on the notion of reduplication because the dispossession of the flesh underwrites notions of political freedom and the fantasy of manumission, the freed kidney. The theft of the heart as non-reduplicative calls into question both the gift and the commodity as rhetoric and alibi that underwrite the organ trade, revealing the premier's mantra, people helping people as a ruse. The premier and the corrupt pursuit of sustained life through the substitution of her death for that of another would appear to allegorize the fantasy of the regenerative body, or as John Fro suggests, the myth of restoration is the myth of resurrection. The high technology fantasy of endlessly renewable life feeds the demand for new forms of vitality and biovalue created by new biotechnologies. However, with the premature death of Mami Grosjean, the novel suggests that the high technology fantasy of the endlessly renewable life and, the, and its new forms of vitality and biovalue, and I would argue freedom, are underwritten by the mythic time of blackness, a static telos that disaggregates flesh and body in time over time. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Jax. Uh, next, we will hear from Professor Christina Sharp, who is a professor in the Department of Humanities at York University, Toronto, and a distinguished visiting professor in the Faculty of Community Services at Ryerson University. She's the author of two books, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, which was named by The Guardian and The Walrus as one of the best books of 2016 and was a nonfiction finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award and Monstrous Intimacies, Making Post-Slavery Subjects, both by Duke University Press. She is currently working on a third monograph, Black Still Life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I have my slides? Oh, there they are. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so it's a pleasure to be on this panel, and I want to, can you all hear me? Okay, and I want to add my thanks to everyone else's. So thanks to Farah, to Kelly, to Sharon, and I feel I especially owe thanks to Sean, who sent me many urgent emails, um, <laughs> <laughs> to which I finally responded in a flurry. Um, so that we may outlast our forms means we are called by different names, child, woman, dirt, mud, ocean, Aracilis Germe, I think I'm saying her name right. So I want to think very briefly about being undisciplined, which does not mean proceeding without attention or without care, but rather attending to what's required to undo the ongoing, quote, racial calculus and po political arithmetics of chattel slavery. So I think this is work that many people are doing. Um, I think my co-panelists, I think Jessica Cruz, Saidia Hartman, Tina Camp, Marisa Fuentes, Jafari Allen, Kiguro Masharia, and I could go on naming many other people. So I think this is work that's not theorizing from social and political victimhood, nor from a stance of proving black humanity. This is work theorizing from a political aesthetic and position that begins inside black and attempts to rewrite the world from the view of all that blackness might mean. So our task has been to describe and apprehend the multiple ways that black people make life. And I'm really thinking with Jafari this morning and his work, 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 that um, all of this work that black lesbian feminists um, did in the 1980s that we really might still contend, that we should contend with. Um, so our task has been to describe and apprehend the multiple ways that black people make life, how to describe that living in the face of the state's malevolence. You can't hear me? Okay. Just turn it down a little bit. Turn it down? All right. Uh, to imagine and inhabit other wises that are already being lived, ones that allow for and sustain the possibility of something like black life. The work of seeing these strands and holding these histories in presence is part of the work of thinking from black, the work of imagining futures, the work of making black life live off and on the page. And so the work I'm sharing today is in its beginning stages and taken from a much longer piece. Some of it I've shared before, but I think about the practices as well of repetition, incremental shifts, about the work of sitting and staying with and digging down. So I went to the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in December 2018, and I don't know how many of you have been there. Can people tell me? How many people have been to the, okay. Um, so when I, was describing my visit to a friend who's a professor at OCAD in Toronto and a curator, she said that though she hadn't yet been, she imagined the relevance of Elizabeth Alexander's 1994 essay, Can You Be Black and Look at This, reading the Rodney King video. Alexander's essay shows the ways that black suffering and ongoing violence against black people are invisible and inaudible to many ears, as the taped beating that supposedly incontrovertible evidence of police brutality against King is thrown into question. We see the ways that violence against black people is often understood not to be violence. The structure of much of the museum and memorial made me ask, can you be black and stand there? But I'm going to turn to soil, and I'm happy to talk about that at another point. Um, in questions. I imagine that the questions of dirt are more questions of witness over thousands of years. Aracilis Gume. So I'm thinking that organic matter provides a different account and a necessary account of black diasporic dying, living, and movement. And so I'm thinking and learn from here something like Vanessa Agar Jones's What the Sands Remember. So I first encountered these jars of soil from the EJI. Are you seeing them? Okay these jars of soil from the Equal Justice Initiative after a visit to the Forbes Pigment Library at the Harvard Art Museums. So the Forbes Pigment Library boasts that it's the, the largest collection of pigments in the world, 2,500 samples. And for me, these jars of pigment are a kind of visual analogy to the EJI soil project. These are beautiful and awful and rare pigments used in conservation efforts as well as to authenticate paintings. The majority of the pigments were collected from 1910 to 1944, but they're still being collected. They abstract their histories of violence, colonization, theft, and coercion, visible and invisible in the language of collection, value, rarity, purity, authenticity, and beauty. The color mummy brown, for instance, which was popular in European painting from the 16th to 19th century, is made from the bodies of preserved Egyptians and their animals. That there, there was a mummy trade despite legal, um, despite 
um, legal restrictions. And you might look at this, lamp black, C, condensed smoke of a luminous flame, Cameroon, 1929. How was this collected? Under what conditions of colonial violence? So these pigments are prized. Um, and what I'm going to turn to in relation to the soil project are the disprized. So when I first started working on the soil collection project, I feel like I'm channeling Jafari who said he was gonna speak quickly. I'm speaking quickly. So when I first encountered those jars of soil, Oh, sorry, when I first started working on the soil collection project, it was a small portion of this work. I thought that attending to soil would let me do something similar to thinking about residence time in the ocean. So like residence time, soil connects past and present. Soil brings the past into the present. I thought that soil would allow me to think about processes, environments, and memory, and I think it in fact does do all of those things through the entanglement quote of soil and the social. So these photographs I turn to now document the process and the result of one of the EJI's community remembrance projects. The memorial projects are an offshoot of and in conjunction with their legal work. And I'm particularly interested in this project that seeks to commemorate known black victims of lynching through soil collection. Brian Stevenson says, quote, we cannot heal the deep wounds inflicted during the era of racial terrorism until we tell the truth about it. The geographic, political, economic, and social consequences of decades of terror lynchings can still be seen in many communities today, and the damage created by lynching needs to be confronted and discussed. Only then can we meaningfully address the contemporary problems that are lynching's legacy, end quote. Of course, these ongoing consequences, these contemporary problems are lived differently by different people. Wealth accumulation, education, the transfer of property, et cetera, or the ongoing dispossession and the precarities of the afterlives of slavery. The Soil Collection Project was part, as I said, of a community remembrance project in which community members were invited to collect into jars soils from sites where black people were lynched from Tennessee to the eastern shore of Maryland. So the jars filled with soil are, are of a uniform size. They're clear glass, gallon sized with a black screw top lid. The soil is silt, loam or clay, sandy, peaty, chalky. The soil's different colors, browns, yellows, reds, grays, blacks, some combination depending on the organic matter content, the particular mineral content, the amount of oxygen and the amount of weathering. And weathering is the breaking down of soil through contact with the Earth's atmosphere, water, et cetera. We also know weathering as a term by which to describe the long-term deleterious effects of anti-blackness on black women in particular. Some of the composed organic matter in the soil is visible, like leaves and twigs, and there are, of course, other organic matter and living organisms in it that are visible and invisible to the eye. The jars are all labeled, some of them with the first and last name of the person who was lynched, the city and town and state, the month, day, and year of the lynching. Some are labeled with a line in place of a first name, and under that line is a surname, the place, month, day, year of the lynching. Some of the jars have unknown in place of a name and then the date of the lynching. Some of the jars of soil are grouped together to indicate multiple people were lynched on the same day and in the same place. These five jars hold dirt gathered from the site where Paul Hill, Paul Archer, Will Archer, Emma Fair, and Ed Guyton were shot to death by a white mob in Carrollton, Alabama on September 14, 1893. Black people were lynched individually and in groups made up of friends, neighbors, strangers, families, people known and unknown to each other and swept up in white violence. This slide shows soil collected into four jars on the site where four members of the Cross family were lynched by a mob of white men. Jim Cross was shot in the doorway of their home and his wife and their children were murdered inside the home. The first name and surname of Jim Cross is recorded here, but the given names of his wife and their two children, a boy and a girl, remain unrecorded. The Cross family were lynched after Jim Cross condemned an earlier eruption of white mob violence and the lynching of another black man in Lettahatchee, Alabama in 1900. The soil color and texture change from location to location, but the jars and therefore the fact of the lynching repeat. In its presentation, the soil is beautiful, the jars filled with soil, as well as the photographs of the jars filled with soil are beautiful and terrible. By themselves, the abstract and the material fact of them, though, refuses to repeat the terror of the almost endlessly recirculated image of the brutalized body of the black person. So it's clear that the violence multiplies, and it's also clear 
that even when an unknown or a line appears in place of a given name, that this is not the violence of fungibility. It's not the ditto ditto or Negro woman, Negro man, Negro girl in the ship manifest or the plantation ledger. This gathering of soil and, la and, and labeling neither repeats the dehumaning violence nor does it refuse the fact of white supremacist and anti-black violence. So what kinds of knowledge does the continued circulation of the results of brutality in the form of the black body produce and for whom? To what end are we supposed to continue to need to see and circulate the body of the brutalized to death black person? How does one, to use the words so often used by such institutions, um, say never again and come to terms with, which often means move past, ongoing quotidian atrocity? How does one come to terms with an ongoing brutal imagination by engaging the materialization of that imagination? The EJI initiative uses this language. Quote, EJI believes that truth and reconciliation are sequential. We must address oppressive histories by honestly and soberly recognizing the pain of the past. As more communities join this effort to concretize the experience of racial terror through discourse, memorials, markers, and other acts of truth telling, more are overcoming these shadows cast by these grievous events, end quote. And, quote, through this reckoning with the truth of our nation's past, we can begin a necessary conversation that advances healing and reconciliation, end quote. So Henry Louis Gates's current series on Reconstruction, which I haven't seen, but I have seen this trailer, includes an interview with Brian Stevenson. In the interview, Gates says, quote, we haven't been able to change the narrative about slavery. What makes you optimistic that we can change the narrative about lynching, end quote? To which Stevenson replies, yeah, you should watch the video, the, the short trailer. I think the narrative is going to change as we begin to show this brutality. We haven't created spaces in America that motivate people when they go through it to say never again to racial violence and racial hierarchy. And that for me is the reason why things like the memorial and museums like this are direct in presenting this legacy and violence of lynching become necessary. I want us to tell the truth about our history not because I want to punish America, but because I want to liberate us. But we can't get to liberation if we don't acknowledge what we've done. End quote. So one is asked to assume a certain position as one enters this space. And I remain uninterested in memorial narratives that offer black suffering as a pathway to knowledge, national healing, and reconciliation. To quote Claudia in the bluest eye, that's adjustment without improvement. Um, that we, that us, that are require a commitment to reforming nation in which this violence is anomalous and not foundational. As Frank Wilderson tells us, shared experiences in the realm of the social do not necessarily index shared experience, shared positions in the realm of the structural. So do we need to turn our attention to the smiling or somber or interested or jubilant but not disgusted faces of the white people who gathered in small and large groups, witness and participant to the murder and maiming of black people? In Cruelty is the Point, an article in The Atlantic by Adam Serwer about white supremacy and the cruelties and the pleasures in the cruelty in the present, that is where he turns, to the crowds who smile into the camera in historical lynching photos. He writes, quote, their names have been mostly lost to time, but these grinning men were someone's brother, son, husband, father. They were human beings, people who took immense pleasure in the utter cruelty of torturing others to death and were so proud of doing so that they posed for photographs with their handiwork, jostling to ensure they caught the eye of the lens so that the world would know they'd been there. Their cruelty made them feel good. It made them feel proud, it made them feel happy, and it made them feel closer to one another." End quote. But those weren't just white men in those photos. They were also white women, white girls, and white boys. They were smiling, sometimes somber, sometimes rapturously attentive. And Kimberly Juanita Brown reminds us that those largely unnamed people are not simply lost to time. Some or even many of the white children who appear in these photographs may be alive and the people who call them brother, son, father, grandmother, husband, et cetera, et cetera, have with very few exceptions chosen to remain silent in the face of those photos' political and ethical demands. So not lost, hidden, and the demand is uneven and we're called to do different things. So I want to suggest that perhaps the collected soil asks or invites or requires that we attend to this differently, that we, to quote Amber Musser, otherwise probe the relationship between representation and knowledge production. 
So there's a, a video of Anthony Ray Hinton collecting soil in Montgomery, Alabama from the site where Joe Souls was lynched. Holding the jar he's just filled, Mr. Hinton speaks to Joe Souls. He says, quote, I hope your body is at peace and you are at peace. I came here today so hopefully I can get your DNA and take it to a place where it will be respected and not leave your DNA on this roadside, end quote. So past and present meet as Mr. Hinton, who was a death row exoneree, who was represented by Brian Stevenson. He spent 28 years on death row in Alabama after he was found guilty of two murders that he did not commit. In The Guardian, he writes, quote, I had to watch 54 men walk past to be executed. My cell was 30 feet from the chamber, and I could smell the burning flesh. They were 22 who took their own life. Mr. Hinton has been, to quote Colin Dyan, held in the body of the state. But what's so powerful and generative about the soil collection project, at least for me, is that it's a collecting and a holding of history and matter and grief. And so I want to think about what soil as living and dying archive teaches us, not as a claim to country or state or nation or progress, but as material, as sedimented, living, changing, and dying matter, as matter with a memory. Quote, the soil holds the memory of the Middle Passage. It holds the memory of labor and premature black death. The extreme violence dealt to black bodies is recorded on the earth. To live in the afterlife of slavery is to be a time traveler, so long as one knows that soil holds memory, end quote. So I think of this holding of matter and memory as an act of care in opposition to the holdings of bones and matter, the holdings of mementos by those people who participated in lynchings, those people who were also collectors of hair, teeth, bone, clothing, and then the photographs of the people they brutally murdered. I think that what the EJI and the volunteers have done through the collection of soil, and by collection I mean the digging, pouring, tamping down, the physical act of touch and collecting the soil into jars is work that is counter to that other violently white supremacist and anti-black holding. So in this soil, says Brian Stevenson, there is the sweat of the enslaved. In this soil, there is the blood of victims of racial violence and lynching. There are tears in the soil from all those who labored under the indignation and humiliation of segregation. But in the soil, there's an opportunity for new life, a chance to grow something hopeful and healing for the future, end quote. Again, I'm not interested in those kinds of narratives that would use black suffering for healing and reconciliation. In a conversation in 2017 at Art Basel with the artist Charles Gaines, Stevenson speaks his hope that providing a narrative, a kind of through line from Middle Passage to plantation slavery to lynching and mass incarceration, that the Legacy Museum might produce empathy and give visitors a grand vision of black life. But I'd like to stay with the soil as a powerful medium, and it's the fact of the collection of the soil, though not its placement in the museum, because it's actually installed, flanked by videos which mobilize those photographs of brutalized black people that seems to me to enact care as, quote, an antidote to violence. So I'm trying to think now about the afterlife of soil in this collecting of dead and living matter, compacted material, archives of soil and dirt. The conditions under which the jars of soil are installed in the Legacy Museum, they're actually two identical collections. One is in the EJI offices, and then one is installed in the Legacy Museum. And they're kept under different conditions. But installed as they are in the Legacy Museum, they're installed under intense light and heat which has caused condensation in some of the jars, and in them, things have begun to grow. And so if you look closely at this image, at this image you can see that. Um, and I don't know if the curators anticipated or intended for those changes in the soil, but I think the changes get at something important that I'm trying to think through about black still life, about soil memory and spaces where despite everything, something like black life might take hold. I also want to ask, what if there were no displays in the Legacy Museum of photographs of black people who'd been lynched? What if the columns at the memorial that are inscribed with the county's dates, names of the murdered, at, at, um, weren't hanging? What if we sat with the soil as instruction or, instruct or as instructive on thinking about the entanglements of soil and the social? What if we took it as an invitation and an opportunity to imagine? So coda, dust.
So there's a moment in Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust, when in the midst of the gathering before part of the family leaves for the sea, leaves the sea island for the northern mainland, Nana Pazant becomes distraught. So in her distress, she cries out, tells her family she doesn't understand how they can leave the soil. We flash back then to a moment of her own questioning. A young Nana Pazant runs to the spot where her husband is planting seeds. A heel digs a hole, a hand drops seeds, a heel replaces the dirt. Nana Pazant has something in her hands. She stops and sinks to her knees, her palms, her hands open, palms up. She looks up and the dirt that's in her hand is being blown away from the in the wind. And she says to her husband, how can we plant in this dust? To which he replies, we plant them each and every year or we finished. So the exhaustion of the soil, the memory of dirt, the movement of dust, we keep making theory from, of, and for our lives. And finally, last year at a police board meeting in Los Angeles, California, a woman named Sheila Hines Brim threw the ashes of her niece, Waukesha Wilson, who died in LAPD custody in 2016 at the head of the LAPD, Charlie Beck. As she threw them, she made the following powerful statement. That's Waukesha, she's going to stay with you. So Heinz Brim was arrested and after her release, she said, I used her ashes so they could be with him. So he could feel her because he murdered her. So Wakisha Wilson's cries for help went unheard or at least unattended to. So I'm trying to hear in Heinz Brim's actions, her political act and her demand, her ethics of dust. When Heinz Brim throws what she says are her niece's, niece's ashes, they don't only land on Beck, they disperse, they circulate, they cause the room to be cleared, a hazmat team's called. But as we know, the emergency is not her throwing of what she said were her niece's ashes, it's the long state of emergency for black people. Heinz Brim's act is a powerful act of refusal and a refusal to be silent, a refusal to not mourn and to not act in the face of murderous intent. It's not a plea for reconciliation or recognition in certain ways. To think with Troyot, Heinz Brim has taken the present into her own hands. So this is a story of struggle, which is to say there's exhaustion and still ongoing desires, theories, and commitments to live free. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharp. Our final panelist is Professor Joseph Witt Winters, who's an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Duke University. His research interests lie at the intersection of black religious thought, black literature, and critical theory. His first book, Hope Draped in Black, Race, Melancholy, and the Agony of Progress, examines how black literature and aesthetics challenge triumphant accounts of progress and freedom. As an alternative to racial progress narratives, he contends that authors like Du Bois and Morrison link hope to remembrance, mourning, and a recalcitrant sense of the tragic. His next project, Disturbing Profanity, Hip Hop, Black Aesthetics, and the Volatile Sacred, explores how hip hop reimagines sacred value in religious experience. <laughs> welcome, please, let's welcome <laughs> Joseph Winters. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I would also like to uh, extend uh, Thanks and gratitude to, to Farah, Kelly, um, Sean, and Sharon for inviting me and for organizing this conference. Um, this is, uh, I'm going last on this amazing panel, right? These are uh, four people on this panel that I, whose work I read and they've uh, deeply influenced how I, how I think about these things. So let me just give a, just a bait, real uh, small introduction to this work. Um, last spring, my colleague Jay Cameron Carter and I taught a course on contemporary black studies. And one of the things that we were both interested in is how in so much of contemporary black studies, there's a kind of gesturing towards the sacred, right? A gesturing towards a spirituality. It's not always fleshed out. So we're, we're both in religious studies. That's something we kind of do, right? So that's kind of what we're, we're trying to think through. In the past decade, a set of debates has emerged within black studies between Afro-pessimists and black optimists. Exemplified by the work of Frank Wilderson, the Afro-pessimist contends that the human and the black exist in an antagonistic non-relationship. To put this differently, civil society in the realm of recognition is defined over and against black people. The very coherence of the human depends on structural violence against black flesh. According to Wilderson, only the end of the world as we know it can bring about the dissolution of anti-black racism. So there's a kind of an apocalyptic logic here that hasn't been developed. Black optimism, represented by Fred Moten, also contends that blackness has been positioned at the edges of the human, yet Moten defines blackness as a tumultuous drive that both antecedes and incites strategies of containment. While blackness is constantly under surveillance and duress, Moten expresses a kind of faith or devotion in the excessive quality of blackness, in that which cannot be captured or reduced into an object, instrument, or slave. 
Consequently, Moten underscores more than the pessimists, the forms of sociality that have, enabled, that, have ena that have enabled black people to endure a legacy of terror and living death. The opposition between the, the pessimist and the optimist can become rigid and reified, and not necessarily by those people who are affiliated with these positions. In response to this predicament, this paper argues that we can better understand the affinities and differences between authors like Wilderson and Moten by introducing the category of the sacred or a particular genre of the sacred. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Giorgio Agamben might be helpful here. I turn to some other people. Jeremy Biles reminds us that there are two forms of the sacred, one that signifies health, safety, and protection, which you might associate with whiteness, and the other that stands for disorder, opacity, and impurity. The latter form, the left-hand sacred, is taken up by George Bataille in Theory of Religion and Accursed Share. For Bataille, the sacred names those energies, drives, and experiences that interrupt investments in order, coherence, and durability, or production. The sacred experienced momentarily in art, erotic life and mysticism is a site of heterogeneity, of that which cannot be incorporated into the order of things, which is why the heterogeneous often incites so much violence in the attempt to contain, confine, and assimilate it. In other words, because figures of excess appear so dangerous to the order of reason and accumulation, these figures tend to precipitate gratuitous forms of violent containment. In light of the ways in which black bodies and black flesh has been marked as excessive, dangerous, and unruly, the left-hand sacred provides one way to examine blackness and the relationship to the human. In my work, I draw on the left-hand sacred and religious thought more generally to think between and beyond the pessimism-optimism binary. I contend that while Moton underscores the excessive feature of blackness, Wilderson draws attention to the in inability of civil society to assimilate blackness demonstrated by cinema's failed attempt to reconcile racial antagonisms. Recently, Calvin Warren has suggested a better way to think about Fred Moton's intervention is by affiliating Moton with mysticism rather than optimism or hopefulness. Mysticism on this, read, on this reading generally names a religious or spiritual experience in which the very notion of a discrete, coherent self is overwhelmed by the other, an experience that cannot be captured by ordinary language or that requires alternative grammars to name and describe it. For Warren, Moton provides grammar to think about blackness without being. Blackness is a kind of spirit or aspiration that eludes form, objectness, and possession. Here we might think of the opening scene in, in the break as Moton describes blackness as, quote, the extended movement of a specific upheaval, an ongoing eruption that and arranges every line, evidence that objects or commodities do resist even or precisely at the moment of objection slash subjection, thinking of Aunt Hester's cry in a call and response with Sadia Hartman's refusal of the nonchalant ways that Douglas's primal scene is often registered. Moton is after, quote, an orality that disrupts and resists certain formations of identity. To put it simply, the sound of the shriek extended throughout time is irreducible to verbal meaning or conventional musical form. Something es escapes, even as what escapes is an indication of anguish, carrying the trace of terror of what is always trying to eradicate blackness. In later essays, Moton develops this notion of blackness in, in, uh, as rupture and excess, verging toward what Warren calls a phenomenology of black spirit, um, riffing on, on Hegel um, and maybe riffing on Hortense Pillars, who said, I always like to make Hegel speak my language. In the case of blackness, Moton associates blackness with a kind of impurity or contamination or that which smears or blurs stable distinctions and demarcations. For Moton, blackness names a kind of reticence that emanates from what is kept, held, and contained, yet it's also a reluctance that disrupts the logic of grasping and framing, taking and keeping, as, epist as epistemic stance and accumulative activity. Here I take it that Moton is circling around a set of questions. What is the form of life that unravels the very insistence on form? How might blackness offer an alternative to the logic of, of, of accumulation and settlement, even as or because blackness has been the underprivileged target of these operations? If Moton gestures toward the spiritual and mystical aspects of blackness in previous essays, he makes an explicit connection in blackness and nothingness, or mysticism in the flesh. In conversation with Afro-pessimists, um, particularly Wilderson and Sexton, Moton takes two key, makes two key moves in this essay. Riffing on Orlando Patterson's work, Moton makes a distinction between political and social death, while the slave, <clears throat> might endure political death insofar as she is barred from the field of recognition, from the field of rights, ownership, and property. This means that the slave is relegated to a position of relative nothingness from the perspective of the subject that occupies or thinks he or she occupies a position within civil society. But for, Mo for Moton, nothing matters. Nothing matters at all. For Moton, the legacy of blackness gestures toward a sociality of those who have been owned, who own nothing, who have been dispossessed of something like home. This sociality uh, can be found in the fantasies and wounded intimacies in the hold of the slave ship, Bush Arbor meetings, juke joints, hip hop ciphers, greetings in the vestibule of the church after service, or gatherings with primarily black women discussing Beyonce's new video over wine and other libations. I'm very familiar with this because I'm told by my wife, you can leave now, right? While lingering on this position of nothingness, 
Moten turns to Korean Buddhism, particularly the idea of, of mu, of dispossession, of not having, as a way to think about a form of sociality among the unsettled, among those who find their beginnings in the break, the middle, the oceanic. If there is something celebratory about the mysticism in the flesh, celebration is necessary because black life is so painful, it hurts so much. For Moten, blackness articulated through the musical cry and through mysticism indicates a disruptive excess and unassimilable energy that haunts ontology, sovereignty, property, and the urge to possess. Drawing on Naum Chandler's work and, and riffing on Heidegger, Moten makes a, a distinction between blackness and black people, or para-ontological distinction, right? Blackness is, is an original antecedent to being, logos, and law, et cetera, that black people do not own but have an underprivileged relationship to. Blackness is a testament both to a legacy of constitutive violence and relentless containment and a legacy of what slips through, what breathes on, and what cannot be completely converted into an object. Blackness acts, acts as a kind of pathogen that promises to bring about the end of the world as we know it. While Moton's relationship to mysticism and the religious is, implicit, is explicit in the uh, aforementioned essay, Wilderson's connection to the religious is more tenuous, although in a very important interview wallowing in contradictions with Percy Howard, he does confess that he has a spiritual advisor, Babalao, who, he helps, who helps him connect with the ancestors. In addition, Wilderson does not seem to focus much on the distinction between blackness and black people or the black spirit that eludes capture and objectification through performance and sociality. Rather, he wants to keep our attention and attunement fastened to the violence that brings the black, the slave, into the lowest levels of existence, the violence that provides the coherence for civil society, the human, and the world more broadly. As Patrice Douglas pointed out to me in a recent conversation, Afro-pessimism resists the positive or celebratory move because of the ways in which blackness is constantly being mobilized to recuperate and affirm a social order that relies on black anguish. So just think here, maybe four years ago, just a day after the shooting of nine members of Emmanuel AME Charleston, in, in AME, uh, sorry, Emmanuel AME in Charleston, South Carolina, blacks being interviewed about the virtues of black humility, perseverance, and forgiveness, virtues that were supposed to represent the best of U.S. democracy. So at the moment, right, so the U.S. democratic project is being recuperated before the blood could even be removed from the church. But let us linger a bit on Wilderson's definition of Afro-pessimism. According to Wilderson, though blacks are indeed sentient beings, the structure of the entire world's cement semantic field, regardless of cultural and national discrepancies, is sutured by anti-black solidarity. Whereas other groups relate to the social world through conflict and alienation, conflict that can be resolved or reconciled, blacks and to some extent native peoples are positioned in an antagonistic relationship to the world. To put it differently, the very coherence of civil society and the legal order depends on structural and excessive violence directed toward black people, not to mention the disavowal of this gratuitous violence in the name of progress, the post-racial and US exceptionalism. This means that the end goal for black freedom struggles cannot be recognition or inclusion within the domain of the human, according to Wilderson, whereas humans exist on the same plane of being and thus can become existentially present through some struggle for, uh, struggle for, of, or through recognition, blacks cannot reach this plane. As I take it, the distinctions here between antagonism and conflict or alienation and accumulation, recognizability and abjection, indicate that there is an excess that, that civil society cannot assimilate or incorporate. Yet whereas Moton seems to celebrate and exalt this excess, what he alludes to as a kind of devotion to blackness, Wilders Wilderson prioritizes the violence that sustains this antagonistic relationship or non-relationship between the world and blackness, the anguish that permeates being held out into the nothing, the terror of being the permanent inside slash outside that the world defines itself over and against. And even as civil society attempts to diminish or disavow this racial antagonism through converting the antagonism to a resolvable conflict, Wilderson shows that this, this strategy of structural adjustment does not always work. As the, title of his 2000, or the subtitle of his 2010 text uh, indicates, Wilderson identifies cinema as a primary example of the tendency to depict black-white relationships as reconcilable conflicts. Think here of the interracial buddy film or the white savior film. At the same time, Wilderson finds a flicker of possibility within film, moments when the attempt to contain racial antagonisms breaks down and fails. These are moments when cinematic strategies such as lighting and sonic designs enable the grammar of antagonism to break through on the mendacity of conflict. These are flashpoints when the violent relationship between the human and blackness erupts onto the screen. Here you might think at the end of uh, Monster's Ball, when the lighting the contrast between Billy Bob Thornton's character and Holly Berry's character show how a kind of racial antagonism haunts the depiction of interracial intimacy and reconciliation. While Wilderson, while, I'm sorry, while Wilderson is a bit more reticent than Moton in giving attributes and predicates to blackness, as excess, as break, as contamination, he does suggest that there are moments in cinema and civil society when the violence attached to black flesh interrupts the regularly scheduled program. So what does all this have to do with the sacred? <laughs> Probably like, okay, that's nice. <laughs> I, I know that, I've read these authors. What does this have to do with the sacred? With what I'm calling the volatile sacred? I imagine a, skepti a skeptical listener 
wondering why we should even want to retain this category in the context of black operations and Afro-pessimism. Has not a conventional notion of the sacred as what needs to be protected and safeguarded through divisions and borders been the site and justification of so much terror, theft, and erasure? With regard to racial and gender re regimes, Frederick Douglass in his second slave narrative or version of the narrative claims that blacks on the plantation are disciplined to treat the master or white ma male subjectivity with a kind of sanctity and the master's house as a quote, sacred precinct. And Hortense Spillers describes the formation of racial hierarchies where distinction is imagined as transcendence as a quote, symptom of the sacred, end quote. Sylvia Winter shows us that coloniality and slavery were made possible were made possible in part by the rearticulation of theological categories and divisions, spirit versus flesh, redeemed versus unredeemed. So what are we to make of the idea of the sacred, an idea and operation that often remains implicit in social life, that often is involved in the governing of racial formations and anti-black uh, racism, even if offstage? So let me just say a little bit, okay. So according to someone like Emile Durkheim, religious life does not necessarily involve belief in gods and deities. In fact, these powers are not essential to religious life. What is essential is the distinction between the sacred and the profane. The sacred is that which is set apart through taboos and prohibitions as a source of communal value, meaning, and cohesion. The sacred is designated for objects, ideas, and spaces that contribute to the formation of community that groups can rally around. But Durkheim acknowledges that two genres of the sacred, the amb ambiguity of set apartness, right, what some have called the right hand and left hand sacred. The former, right, you can imagine communities that are set apart, right from um, signifiers of disorder and contamination, and those communities are supposed to be, right, that, that, those are, rep to, are supposed to represent life, health, and order, right? But you can also think of another notion of being set apart as those bodies, entities, right, forces that are set apart as a, in the form of a kind of confinement and containment precisely because they represent some kind of threat to the social order. Right? So there's a, two, there's, there's a double, there's a duplicity to this notion of being set apart that um, George Bataille takes up and I want to take up. George Bataille takes up this distinction in his work. In Theory of Religion, where Bataille loosely develops these ideas, the French author seems to make a stark distinction between sacred and profane modes of being. For Bataille, the profane realm is marked by what he calls discontinuity or lack of intimacy, instrumental reasoning, and the deferral of pleasure. Within this domain, human selves treat human and non-human beings as useful objects within future-oriented schemes and projects. In other words, I relate to and interact with others insofar as they support and buttress my sense of becoming a coherent self, enduring into an endless future. While this investment in a coherent self that treats the world in an instrumental manner is all too human and inescapable, Bataille suggests that it prevents the kind of intimacy that humans long for. For Bataille, the sacred realm is associated with the possibility of intimate relationships with others, self-undermining encounters that are marked by excess, vulnerability, and anguish. While profane existence is all about production, accumulation, and self-preservation, sacred existence includes events, interactions, and practices that lead to the loss, expendi the loss or expenditure of the coherent self and an opening to the painful contradictions that mark our life worlds. For Bataille, intimacy between self and other is not devoid of pain and anguish. It is a way of communicating through wounds. <clears throat> he also associates these experiences, right, with a kind of opacity, right, with a kind of beclouded consciousness, right? But there's obviously some questions we might want to ask, right? Um, Bataille might be good at thinking about the relationship between the self uh, and this, these extravagant forms of excess, right? Um, but what do we need to make of bodies, flesh, and populations that are systemically placed in the position of abjection, or those who are marked off and cordoned off by practices and projects of containment, those who have been denied something like a coherent subject position? In other words, how does Bataille's distinction right, between the sacred and profane get modified when we take seriously the intersection of blackness, gender, and sexuality, for instance? Right? So here there's kind of, within Bataille's notion of the sacred, there's two points of emphasis. One is on this kind of excess, which I take Moten to be kind of dr drawing on, right? This notion that sacred is that which cannot be subordinated to meaning, form, or property. And then there's this notion for Bataille, right? Where the sacred is that which kind of dis interrupts and unravels, right? Um, uh, structures of power and violence, right? And I take that, that Wilderson is focusing on the more, more this more kind of apophatic, right? This moment where, right, um, practices within civil society kind of fail and break down, right? So, because as, as Professor Allen pointed out, you know, why do we have to go to the French thinker, right? Why am I going to George, right, George Bataille, right? But hopefully my, my, in, in the broader project, right, because Bataille is the person who, who, who in, my, in my field people are reading, right? So the hope is to go from Bataille to very quickly to um, M. Jackie Alexander, who thinks very seriously about the production of sacred value through memory, right? Trans, trans, trans gener, uh, gener, uh, uh, transgenerational memory, right? And remembers in a kind of counter memory, right? In, in different forms of crossing, including crossing the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I also want to take seriously Alexis Gums, right? Um, in her kind of poetic 
um, you know, Booker Ode to, to Hortense Spillers. There's a moment, in the, a brief moment in the, in, the, in the initial note where she talks about the possibility of creating a dedicated space, and she uses the language of sacred space, but it's a fleeting space marked by breaks, wounds, a wounded intimacy, right? She calls it also, because of the notion of spill, it's also an excessive space, it's a queer space, right? And I think she brings together both the right hand and left hand sacred in ways that I think are really powerful. Um, finally, just my hope is that um, to bring, in, in this intersection between black studies and religious studies, my overall argument is that, right, um, if, if black studies accepts kind of, right, the secular kind of orientation within the academy, we really truncate and diminish a lot of black life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all of our panelists. I think we have about 15 minutes for question, comment. I see one very eager hand already shooting up. <laughs> I think there's a microphone right here. Um, yeah, it's on. So I have, uh, can, can you hear me? So I have um, three very brief questions for each of the, for, for three of the panels. What, for, That's for professor, questions. You have three huh? questions each? For Professor Badley, I just wanted I, I just wanted to ask, is there any any in in, in, in uh, Pendel Pendel's work? Is there any engagement with or criticism of uh, implicitly or explicitly of uh, Cindy Cindy Sherman and her uh, film stills uh, in terms of the configuration of of, of white womanhood? No. Um, uh, for Professor Sharp, I just was wondering if you would say a little bit about you, the, the 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 relationship between your responses to the to the soil. And your responses to the uh, uh, the steel coffins, the the, 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 the and which, which you mentioned in passing, but but they're very very different. And I wonder how, how you would, you know, if you just kind of you know expand expand on. I think it's Corbin, the Corbin steel steel coffins that, Horton, or, yeah. Yes. And and then um, um, for Professor Winters, I was just so the French. The French thinker that that, that Moton goes to is not Bataille; it's Deleuze, mm -hmm. right? For a second, you know, the, the, there are explicit invocations of the of, of the religious in 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 Moton, uh, the mantic, the prophetic, and then also in some of his most recent work, uh, the cinematic mo mo monasticism. So, I, I, you know, but but I don't recall any reference to the sacred as such. There's some very specific references. So I was wondering what you might say in the way of of of, of, of thinking about Moton and the religious in terms of the actually. The, the religious categories that he actually uses. You can start. Yeah, I um, think. I mean, I think you. I think you're exactly right. Um, <laughs> that was my fault. Was oh, it's my no, fault. No, oh, oh, no, oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Mine's fast. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what you want to hear about Cindy Sherman. Um, <laughs> I mean, that would be interesting to find out. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the image of Cindy Sherman's whiteness gets sort of digitally reproduced because, you know, she has an Instagram account and, um, you know, questions about, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but, you know, I think, I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll, um, Briefly, um, so I was thinking about the, so I'd been reading and thinking with Francoise Verger's article, A Museum Without Objects, in which she says, you know, um, this is a story of defeat, and she reminds us that defeat means you're involved in struggle, et cetera. And so I was thinking, but, but in, in, she talks about um, one of the first questions that they had to ask when they, were, when they were thinking about what this museum, what shape this museum would take on reunion was, who is this for? And so I kept thinking about uh, who those spaces are actually for, or are there moments of those spaces that are actually for black people? Um, and I think the soil collection is a moment within a museum that's a didactic museum. The teaching begins before you enter. On the side, there's the Maya Angelou quote. And there's the reproduction of the image of the lynching of Thomas, I can't think of his surname now, um, in 1893. Um, there's a triptych. Um, and I kept thinking about the, the fact that black people, this is a long-winded answer. I could try to, let me make it shorter <laughs> so I don't take up all the time. Court and steel soil, we could talk afterwards. Um, I think that, um, like I'm interested in the material because it's, it weathers, it regenerates, it bleeds. 
Um, and I think that those hanging columns, are, as they are installed, are not actually for me. Like the, to walk under them is something as I think a black person. But I think when you exit and you have to pass the Toni Morrison quotation from Beloved where a bit part of the portion of Baby Suggs's sermon in the clearing, you know, um, they yonder, they do not love your flesh, et cetera. I think that is the threshold moment that might be the only moment in the memorial that is actually for black people. Mm. Um, and then you go to the 805 laid out like coffins. So that's a short answer, but I'm happy to talk more. Yeah, that'd be the short answer. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the language of devotion, right? Language of um, monasticism, um, I'm seeing it throughout. So for me, the language of the sacred, I mean, the language of the left hand sacred, right, is, is a signifier for, for certain kind of qualities, certain kinds of, right, um, I guess encounters, experiences, right, that seems to me there's some kind of continuity between how Bataille is using that, right, and how I see, how I see Moton using that. I do, I agree with you. The Deleuze, the Deleuze conversation is something, I'm actually teaching an independent study next semester on Deleuze and Moton, right? So hopefully after that I can better answer that question. All the way in the back. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you all for the um, presentations. And um, Christina, I was, as you were doing your presentation, one of the things that when you show the clip from Daughters of the Dust, and I think you might have alluded to this, um, but I'm, I'm wondering, given the role that various people who are collecting the soil and putting them in the jar, um, and at least some of what I understood out of Daughters of the Dust. In what ways are they also, by focusing on the soil, making claims on the land and belonging in place that maybe attempt to um, make, a, make a sort of ethical claim about belonging that doesn't rely on recognition and acknowledgement in the way that the jars may mm -hmm. work, but, but nonetheless kind of um, asserts there are black people's connection to the land, to the South, to these places of horror as a place where they are nonetheless able to um, establish something or articulate something. And maybe I'm reading too much into that, into what you're saying, but it just struck me with the the Daughters of the Dust and what I remember from that film, that that, um, that that seems like it may be a possibility. I don't know if you've thought about that or if I... Well, I think it's both. Um, so on the one hand, I think that cer certainly Daughters of the Dust, it is about the relationship to the land, right? I don't know how you... I, I, I see it all the time and I teach it, so <laughs> um, I, don't, I, like, I don't know how you can leave the land. But I also want to think about soil as something that moves, that isn't about necessarily about a claim to nation. It might be, about a, it might be a, a relationship to land that is, I think, as what you're asking in the question, outside of a question of kind of not recognition, uh, a claim to nation. So because what I was trying to think about soil um, dirt and dust are, right, their relation, so soil is healthy, dirt is dying, dust is something else. It may or may not be related to soil. And I wanted to think about um, a kind of um, claim to, um, a claim to a kind of history and matter in a place that may not be the same as, as claim to land. Whether that's what happens in Daughters of the Dust, I mean, that really is in some ways about a claim to a land, but I was interested in what the soil, especially in soil collection, but in other iterations of soil too, might let us think about movement, diaspora, um, that gets outside of reforming nation, claiming nation, et cetera. I'm not sure if that's, because I'm not sure I understood the question, but that's what, what I heard made me think. All the way in the way, way back, and then we can come. Oh, Keezy already got it. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm taking advantage of the fact that the mic just came to me. <laughs> um, I, I, 
So uh, I wanted to try to put this panel in conversation with the previous two ones, uh, the previous panels from earlier today and other discussions we've had um, since yesterday. I was just wondering if we could talk a bit about, um, I mean, I love the way, Professor Sharp, you go to the soil as, as the source of inspiration, the EGI, a, a EGI project. It's utterly fascinating. But for the other panelists, I'm just wondering if, if, if we might think about, since this is a session about the theoretical turn, there, there's, there's, a very, there's a very explicit theoretical turn in a number of the papers here in terms of who is cited and who is discussed. And so I was wondering, since we've been thinking about this in a diasporic context, how we might think about some of the individual projects you're working on in relationship to, to the kinds of questions that we're thinking about in terms of looking at blackness globally, looking at uh, you know, uh, other folks who have not been sort of acknowledged the way Jafari and the earlier panelists were doing, uh, or, or just reframing some of the conversation, because my, my fear as an audience member is that I, I sense a kind of conflation, and this is not the panelist's fault. I was on the program committee. Uh, so, I mean, the title of the panel, uh, it, 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 the, the panel seems to be replicating a theoretical term with a certain orientation towards theory, right? And so I'm just wondering about that in relationship to the larger discussions we've been having today. Um, it, it might sound like a hostile question. It really isn't. It's really about thinking about broadening out a conversation beyond the, 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 the ones we've had here uh, during this last hour and a half or so. Um, I, I actually don't understand the question. I can go really fast, so I'm I'm opting out <laughs> of answering and I the wanted question. A clarification. Oh, okay, well I'm opting out of answering the question because I w actually was at a previous conference, so I wasn't here, oh. so I can't really speak to the. <laughs> so can you clarify? Panels. We've heard a lot about Wilderson. I'm just going to be blunt. We've heard a lot about Wilderson. We've heard a lot about Moten. I mean, the last pre presenters spent a lot of time talking about that. And so I'm just wondering about what the implications are for us as we continue to go to certain theories and we think about black studies theory. I mean, I'm being even more honest and, or I'll try to be more explicit, right? Because I, I, I sense that there's, there's a way in which the conversation tends to be rather closed. Uh, and that might be, that just might, ref, might reflect my own disengagement from certain debates, but given, again, that we're thinking about this in a diasporic context, and we're thinking about, you know, broadening our understanding of black studies theory, I, 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 I just fear that there's a, there's a conflation of theoretical turn with Afro-pessimist turn. Well, I'll answer quickly and say that, no, that's not the case in, in, that's not the case in my case, and I don't know that it's the case in, in other people's work either. Um, Maybe that's, um, I mean, I, I called on, you know, uh, various other people's names in terms of doing particular kinds of work. And this project um, will look at um, various sites and thinking about memorials, um, about um, burial sites, et cetera, and will draw on work from South Africa, uh, uh, Latin America, um, the US, Canada, and various other theorists who are located in and writing from those sites. I don't know if I have much to add to what Christina said. Um, similar, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe it'll come back to me at the end after Joseph answers, but. Yeah. No, I just would say, I mean, I, I guess I would say that this is part of a, this is part of a, lar this is part of a larger project, um, hip hop and black aesthetics, so. I mean, I was talking to Yosef about this over lunch. Um, I mean, I, I, I assume that you know, titles, titles like a theoretical turn, right? Um, you know, it's meant to be provocative and so forth. But I, I don't, I don't. I mean, my sense is, you know, that theorizing has always been done by, right? By, I mean, from from Du Bois to Audrey Lorde. I mean, right? Toni Morris. I mean, so, so for me, um, you know, there might be a, I mean, there might be a certain kind of, I don't know, level of abstraction with Wilderson, and, and I'm, I'm not sure, but it seems to me that. I just worry about what, I don't always know what the term theory means when people use it, right? Um, I think I, what I do is I'm, I'm interested in, in certain sites where I can think about blackness and think about how people have tried to develop alternative, right, um, you know, alternative modes of being. But I, I acknowledge I do it usually from a thematic, right, kind of thematic uh, place. But, um, but I understand your concern, but I, I think that, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to suggest that I think that, you know, um, black folk in and outside the academy uh, haven't always been doing something like something like theory, at least generating ideas. Yeah. I mean, and that's actually why I end with Sheila Hines Brim, 
you know, to thinking about Troyo and silencing the past, and you know, you you know, you can't leave history to the guild of historians. That she's taken the present into her own hands, and sort of thinking with um, the, the kind of beautiful work that Saidia did in in um, Wayward Lives, beautiful experiments, and saying, you know, the the radical. Well, Sadia is right here, so I'm, I'm now I'm going to mess up the quotation. <laughs> but the, the, the radical idea behind this work is that poor black women and girls, you know, theorized their worlds and made worlds. So, so it's not even about a kind of calling names, but to attending to what people, how people are making life, resisting in space. Um, so maybe that's a better answer to your question. A better that meaning I'm more satisfied with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. I do we, can we go five extra minutes? I, I don't, so, all right, so the microphone's all the way up there, and so why don't we get that question, then we have two here, we have Professor Griffin and At least Professor we can Young, collect the right? questions, even if we can't answer. Yeah, let's collect these last three, and then each of the panelists can respond as a way of wrapping it up. Like so that. one, two, and three. Cool, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for the papers that I appreciate it very much and learned a great deal. A lot of theorists are now talking about a concept called the great turning, including some from systems theory. Basically, we're at a turning point today, mm -hmm. i.e. we're either going to yeah. um, make some great decisions as a human race, uh, with all the races involved, uh, that will allow us to survive and continue, uh, again, perhaps with hierarchies, perhaps without, or we're going to bust. Or and from the biological point of view, and I'd love to hear, hear, hear your point of view on this, uh, as you spoke about biopolitics, for example, uh, will we continue as a species? And if we do, what is that? For, for the other panelists, as you're speaking about uh, the sacred, if we do, there's a discussion, what is the shared future that we want to design, create within this kind of audience, within the larger audience, and even about the soils, if you will, even taking that to the place of um, the soil upon which we depend for survival and for uh, life. So thank you. So, so we're not waiting on the, do you want to go ahead and before the mic gets and wait for it? All right. Yeah, let's. Okay. It's coming. Can it, we can hear, right? We yeah. can hear you. Yeah, go ahead and then we'll. And then oh. Thank you all. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Jackson. Uh, and um, there was a moment in your talk that I think maybe speaks to this question about the um, ability of the argument you're presenting to sort of resonate in the diaspora framework. And that is when you mentioned briefly in passing that the, um, you offered a kind of critique of the global, now, the global north versus the global south as um, a metaphor for, for race, which I think you know, very much resonates and without reconstructing the whole terms of your <laughs> argument, which it would be embarrassing on my part. Um, I just wanted you to reflect, if you could, a little bit more on what you see as that metaphor, right? In other words, is it presumably not as simple as the global south is black and the global north is white, but like how can the analytic, the fractal thinking that you're thinking with Denise Da Silva um, permit us to um, rework that, that, that metaphoristics of global north versus south such that the version of the African diaspora that you're working, you know, that you're presenting can, can, can resonate politically and theoretically? Um, thank you for this panel. It's just um, so thought-provoking and brilliant, so I'm grateful to all of you. And my question is actually for Christina, but if you don't have time, we can talk about it later. And that was a question about um, the two spaces. So there's that museum with the Maya Angelou quote, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the memorial with the um, pillars. Mm -hmm. And you're right, that, that um, Toni Morrison quotation, which feels like it's for those of us who, um, and my question was one, if you saw a difference between the work that those two things were doing and that it felt to me that um, the, the legacy memorial, I think, one is like the, anyway, the, like, the memorial, legacy the museum. lynching memorial, right, um, felt like there was actually a tension between trying to do something for the project of reconciliation and at the same time trying to acknowledge what you did so beautifully with the, your reading of the soil, the possibilities of the soil. So I was just wondering if you saw them 
engaged in the same project or were those two institutions Great. doing something different? Thank you. Thanks. In whatever order you, uh, I mean, this okay. one, are we adding a fourth question? Oh, sorry. Okay, go sure. ahead. Yeah, please, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thank you all for your comments. Um, in, in thinking through, I think this is connected also to what Professor Nyong'o is asking um, about you to articulate Professor Jackson and thinking through what is meant by the theoretical turn. Um, on the contrary, I'm not, it's, I'm not hearing um, a, like, a consistent invocation of Moton and Wilderson across your works. I'm hearing a lot of winter and not necessarily just to invoke winter, but to think about um, the terms of the project and maybe the abstraction required to apprehend mm -hmm. the violence of the anti-black world. Um, so I wonder if you all could talk about the significance of narrative in drawing on winter and narrative as a feature of that theoretical turn or apprehending narrative, refusing narrative, whether that, um, mm. whether that is at the heart of, of anything that you're doing. And then I also want to ask whether um, in drawing on Professor Winter's conception of the sacred, um, and trying to link it in, in thinking about the theoretical turn, what ought to be, uh, what ought to constitute the sacred in black studies? Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We actually have time to answer these. Uh, so maybe each of you can take one to two minutes, one closer to the one, to offer some final thoughts. Yeah. Man, okay. If you'd like. I'll try. For, I'll try to go good. first. Um, all of those are really good questions, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do any justice to any of them in one minute. And I guess I'll just say um, I cited Hawkinson as a theorist, uh, De Silva, Ashil Mbembe, and Sylvia Winter. So, um, so I, I, I'm. I, I didn't go so much through um, Wilderson and Moton, but more through the people that they cite um, and engage. Um, and I, um, whew, in terms of, of systems theory, I love that question about systems theory. I'm very interested in systems theory. I think a lot with systems theory. Um, I think what I'm suggesting is something like a coherent whole sovereign body actually is something that doesn't take hold um, for black people once black people become black people. And so they're actually, it is not just to evoke system theory, um, openness through closure, but a kind of, um, a kind of perpetually leaking um, body um, it, because actually the closure of the membrane actually can't actually do the work of that regulation um, between outside and inside. Um, I hope that makes sense. I went way system theory on that answer. Um, and then um, in terms of Tavia's question, I just started jotting down um, possible answers to that question, um, but that's a really good question. I want to actually keep thinking about it. Um, and the, what I came up with was naked vulnerability, um, political economic diminishment, um, and state does not offer protect, protection but regulates an absence, an absence of protection. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to keep thinking about it. I love your answer to systems theory. Um, I think I could just, I, I love the question about narrative. Um, and maybe we could talk after. And I think that they're doing, uh, uh, to Farah's question, I think they're doing work that, they, that, that there's something about the legacy museum that is supposed to offset the National Memorial, but I'd like to talk more about it. That's too pat an answer, but I also, yeah, but I'd like to talk more about it. So I guess uh, just two, two very, or did Rizvana, did you want to speak? No one asked me a question, oh. so. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, just two, just basically just two points about this, about the sacred. Um, my, I mean, my sense is, was I'm, the way I'm trying to understand these various authors um, is that the sacred has something to do with protecting, right? Protecting spaces, right? Protecting spaces that make room for something like care, right? Wounded intimacy, right? And that might be some that, that might actually be un, uh, uh, unproductive, right? In the sense of like you know having to lead to some kind of immediate result, right? So I'm trying to fuse together some a traditional notion of the sacred, right? And something that needs to be protected, right? But what 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 I want to, what, what what I think needs to be protected are right spaces that make room for, like I say, care, intimacy, remembering things from the past that don't seem to be useful or productive for narratives of progress and so forth, right? So, um, and I, I, just, I hope I wasn't, I wasn't at all trying to conflate black studies with Afro-pessimism and black optimism. Matter of fact, in most of my work and when I'm teaching um, these authors, I wanna suggest that I th actually think in both cases, both Wilderson and Moten, if we're the representative, both point beyond the, the pessimism, optimism binary right, in their own work and the authors that they draw on, including uh, Professor Hartman, um, Winters, Spillers, and others are always thinking beyond that binary already, right? So, I, but I didn't, I hope that I didn't, was not trying to suggest that black studies right now is all about that, there's all kinds of other conversations happening. All right, um, well, let's please thank our panelists one last time.